This is CNN. Checking some of the headlines in the Persian Gulf crisis, less than 28 hours before the UN deadline for Iraq to withdraw from Kuwait, at the United Nations Security Council members are preparing to hear from Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuellar about his unsuccessful talks with Iraqi President Saddam. Meantime, the French are offering a new diplomatic initiative, but U.S. officials say the plan is, quote, unacceptable because it links an Iraqi withdrawal from Kuwait to a future conference on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In another rubber stamp vote, Iraqi lawmakers decide to back Saddam with their blood and soul in a holy war against the U.S. and its allies. But an Iraqi government official suggests Baghdad eventually will have to pull out of Kuwait. The official tells CNN Iraq's problem with the withdrawal stems from its hang-up about dealing with the UN deadline. Two days after leaving Baghdad, U.S. diplomat Joe Wilson briefs President Bush on the situation in Iraq. Bush administration sources say Persian Gulf diplomacy has reached a, quote, dead end. And the president could order an attack against Iraq by the end of this week. Today, the president signed into law a congressional resolution authorizing such military action if Baghdad fails to withdraw by the mandated UN deadline. And in a late breaking story, the two closest aides to PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat reportedly were shot and killed in Tunis today. The Palestinian security sources say gunmen stormed the home of one of the PLO leaders and opened fire with machine guns. A bodyguard also reportedly was killed. The U.S. State Department says it has no information about the report at this time. More than 450 U.S. warplanes aboard six aircraft carriers are taking position in waters near Iraq. This is just part of the Pentagon's finishing touches on its battle plans. Details from CNN military affairs correspondent Wolf Blitzer. As the aircraft carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt passed through the Suez Canal on the way to the Red Sea, official Washington seemed resigned to war. We are at the end of diplomacy. I believe that we can anticipate combat to start shortly after midnight tomorrow. The carrier America follows on Tuesday, joining the Saratoga, the Kennedy, and the Roosevelt in the Red Sea. On the other side of Saudi Arabia is the Ranger in the Northern Arabian Sea and the Midway inside the Persian Gulf itself. Six carrier battle groups with over 450 warplanes, 80 ships in all, ready to help launch massive airstrikes against strategic Iraqi targets. The Air Force and Marine Corps also say they're ready for any order from President Bush. Army officials say nearly 1,000 additional top-of-the-line M1A1 battle tanks have arrived in Saudi Arabia from Germany. Thousands more troops are still arriving. Pentagon officials say more than 400,000 U.S. troops are in the region. They're aiming for 440,000. The Army says it, too, will be ready. But the airstrikes will likely come first giving the Army up to two more weeks to prepare. At the most senior levels, both in General Schwarzkopf's command and staff headquarters, in the Pentagon, uh, even in the White House Situation Room, they're simply reviewing the last-minute details of the plans that have already been put in place. On the eve of the January 15th deadline, Iraqi mines in the Persian Gulf pose the latest danger to U.S. forces. The Pentagon says 17 mines have been found in recent days and warned Iraq will be held responsible if Navy ships are damaged. A statement warns, the President has made it very clear on numerous occasions that Iraq will be held responsible for any actions that place U.S. lives and interests in jeopardy. U.S. forces have the right of self-defense against hostile actions. Even without hostile actions, however, the accidental U.S. death toll in Operation Desert Shield has reached 102. Over the weekend, a Navy F.A. 18 jet fighter disappeared after taking off from the carrier America in the Mediterranean. And a soldier was killed in a traffic accident in Saudi Arabia. Pentagon officials remain very confident they will quickly and decisively win a war against Iraq. But they are not showing any outward signs of overconfidence. Since the buildup began in August, the talk at the Pentagon was always, if there is war. But now, with the collapse of almost all the last-minute diplomatic initiatives, the phrase has changed to, when there is war. Wolf Blitzer, CNN, the Pentagon. 
Signs of war, rumors of peace. Both played havoc with the oil price barometer today, and when trading was over, light sweet crude had gained $3.49 a barrel for February delivery. The U.S. benchmark oil closed at $30.78 a barrel. And Brent North Sea crude finished at $29.17 a barrel, up $3.52. At one point during trading, prices for U.S. benchmark crude were up almost $5 a barrel, but as rumors of 11th hour peace possibilities swept the trading floor, the prices retreated. season again. When the aches and pains, the fever and chills of the flu get you, it's important to know doctors are recommending Tylenol more than ever. Six times more than aspirin for the flu. Doctors know there's more medicine in extra strength Tylenol than regular aspirin. It's stronger relief for the aches and chills of the flu. Tylenol, the doctor's choice by six to one, and the pain reliever hospitals use most. In American business, there is an award bestowed each year upon a select group of companies. Among the 10 recipients this year, AT&T. The award? The San Francisco Examiner's Golden Turkey for the worst advertising of 1990. We at MCI are glad to have this opportunity to give wider publicity for this award. Just about hourly flights here. 6th of October, United Flight Number 725. Sure, I'll be happy I'll help you with that. Your flight number Arriving in Tokyo at 5, 10 p.m. Both animals are also confirmed. You're welcome. Thanks for calling. In business class. But I think you're in a world fraught with phone frustration, people who fly come to learn of a singular exception, where wishes are granted with efficiency and grace. Della Fria Stokowitzki? Is that with an I or a Y? United Airlines. Come fly the friendly skies. When the sun and the rain have slowly worked their magic and the fruit is simply at its best, it's picked for Smucker's Simply Fruit. Pure, fresh, uncomplicated, Smucker's Simply Fruit is 100% fruit. Pure, spreadable fruit. Smucker's Simply Fruit, just about the closest thing to fresh fruit you'll ever taste. U.S. troops in the Persian Gulf wait for orders with somber anxiety and a sense of deep concern. For months, they've been physically and mentally preparing for warfare. CNN's Charles Jaco has more on the mood of U.S. forces as the deadline in the desert approaches. As the hours tick away, the mood is edgy in the Saudi sands. Yeah, there's a lot of tension in the air around here. Everybody's real anxious. You see the tension building up even the past couple days. Yeah, everybody gets a little bit more tense. For the first time, U.S. officials let journalists tour this air base in the desert. It's the largest U.S. base in Saudi Arabia, a possible signal to Saddam Hussein that the largest concentration of air power marshaled since Vietnam is aimed straight at him. At the headquarters of the British Queen's Royal Lancers elsewhere in the desert, the mood was also ambivalent. I think nervous and anxious is probably the right terms to use. Anyone who is not will be a little bit stupid. And uh, to that extent, yes, everyone obviously has a little bit of nerves about what's going on. But then we have developed our operations now to the form where it's almost a drill. And therefore, you don't have to think, you do it. Drills are the order of the day for journalists and others at the hotel where the U.S., British, and Saudi forces have their information offices. Air raid drills have become commonplace, but this was the first one conducted with gas masks. Despite all the war talk, there was one last stab at some sort of negotiations. A top official from Syria arrived in Riyadh for talks with Saudi King Fahd. The Syrians are part of the multinational force arrayed against Iraq, but the Syrians had told Saddam Hussein they would stand by him if he would get out of Kuwait. Saddam refused. As the winter winds and rain whip through Saudi Arabia, diplomacy is far from the minds of the men and women who may do the fighting and the dying. Feeling a little anxiety but yet we you know i'm a little more alert than i was two weeks ago three weeks ago uh look a little harder uh 
basically just waiting for something to happen. Anxious. Can you explain for me? Just want to get it over with, get home as soon as possible. Going home is not an option anytime soon, though. If it's war or even if peace unexpectedly breaks out, the troops here will probably be here for months, maybe longer. Charles Jaco, CNN, Saudi Arabia. Iraq's neighbor Iran has first-hand knowledge of Saddam Hussein's war-making abilities. Its foreign minister, Ali Akbar Veliati, says the length of an allied war with Iraq depends on how it begins. But he is sure Iraq would use any chemical weapons it might have. Here's part of Ambassador Veliati's conversation Monday with CNN's Frank Sesno. Life in Iran seems quiet now, after years of bloody war with Iraq after Iran's long, hateful break with the United States. Ali Akbar Veliati, Iran's foreign minister, now finds his country courted by both its enemies. Iran on Iraq's eastern border. Which side will Iran now choose to support? A pivotal question if war comes. Do you have any hope that this sort of la last ditch diplomacy can work at this time? I think uh, if uh, the Iraqi government feels that uh, the light forces which are in the Persian Gulf are serious uh, and they are determined to uh, start a war, I think they will think about uh, the result of this terrible war. So, I uh, believe that we have to give more chance to them. Well, what are you suggesting then? Would you propose extending the deadline past the 15th, or do you think that in the remaining time between now and the 15th, then Saddam Hussein will reconsider his position? When we have such a deadline, it doesn't mean that uh, we have to start the war uh, just uh, after that. Uh, I think we have to ask uh, all of us, we have to ask and Mr. Secretary General and support him to continue his efforts to find uh, some solutions for this uh, crisis. Mr. Veliati, earlier this month you said that under no circumstances would Iran take sides in a war if one takes place. You said that neither side was righteous, but when the guns blare, if that in fact is the case, you may well be forced to take a side. How will you choose? Uh, we are determined uh, to be impartial uh, in this war. And uh, we have said repeatedly, and this is our firm position. Do you think it would be a short war? Yes. Uh, I think that uh, it depends how war uh, starts, and um, it depends the planning that the military experts in both sides have in their mind. Much has been made in Iraq of uh, the troop morale there, of Saddam Hussein's hold over his armies. How strong a hold does, in fact, he have in your estimation? Or do you, do you think, for example, that when and if this war starts, that many of the Iraqi troops will cut and run, defect? I think they have a lot of possibilities. Some of the uh, Western countries and the Soviet Union have helped Iraq uh, during the uh, past 10 years. And they have a lot of sophisticated weapons. Uh, and the Soviet Union, as I said, they are well equipped. So uh, I think that they have enough possibilities to resist at least for a uh, period. Would you predict that Iraq would indeed resort to chemical weapons use? If they have chemical weapons, that uh, I think they will not hesitate if uh, war breaks out. This is our uh, anticipation. What would be the consequences for a war in the Persian Gulf in which the United States is the lead member on Iranian-U.S. relations? From the very beginning, uh, we have been against uh, the presence of the United States in the Persian Gulf and also other foreigners. Uh, so, uh, 
we think that uh, the people in this region, uh, I mean the regional countries, can overcome the difficulties that uh, they are facing now. We have to, I mean, we uh, uh, have in, the, in this region, we have to give more chance to the people of this region to solve their uh, own problems. Mr. Foreign Minister, literally hours can now be employed to count down to the UN deadline. I'm wondering if you think that in these final hours there are any realistic prospects that Saddam Hussein will blink, will change his mind and turn around and order his troops out of Kuwait. We do hope that uh, he will change his mind. Uh, this is the nature of this part of the world and uh, also Iraq, uh, that maybe the last minute uh, he will change his mind. This is, this is our hope. That was Iran's Foreign Minister, Ali Akbar Veliati, speaking with CNN's Frank Sesno. 1985, 86, 87, 88, 89. For six straight years, the full-size pickup from GMC truck has retained more of its original value than any other in America. That's why sales of the Sierra are growing faster than any other full-size pickup. And we intend to keep it that way in 1991 with these new Sierras. And in 92, GMC truck. It's not just a truck anymore. It's quality on the road. Pip Printing has just what every rapidly expanding business so desperately needs. Someone to handle all the paperwork. Pip Printing. Give us a call. We'll show you why we're the biggest business printer in the world. I have a horrible sinus headache. There's pounding, there's pressure, there's pain. Today, Linda Clark is trying Tylenol Sinus. Tylenol Sinus took away the pressure. It took away the pain. It took away the pounding. I like that it's a Tylenol product. I trust that name. Tylenol Sinus, the strength you need from the name you trust. And now look for new Tylenol Sinus gel caps. Maximum strength, concentrated, and gelatin coated so they're easy to swallow. Only from Tylenol, the first sinus gel cap. Call 1-800-257-1257 and get your free video with 25 issues of the Sporting News for three payments of just $9.96. Save 52%. Call now, 1-800-257-1257. A new CNN Gallup poll shows most Americans think there is going to be a war in the Persian Gulf, but they are deeply divided over whether it's worth fighting. 1,000 people were questioned over the weekend. 66% said it is very likely that U.S. forces will become engaged in combat. That's a 20% increase in one week's time. 33% say the United States and its allies are most likely to strike right after the U.N. deadline of January 15th. 25% say a military strike is likely within a few days after that deadline. 19% say it will come by the end of January. The poll shows an almost even division on whether a Middle East war is worth fighting. The 46 to 44 split in favor of war falls within the polls margin for error. Anti-war protesters were in the streets of many U.S. cities today. Some 3,000 of these demonstrators clogged downtown Chicago. More than 100 were arrested. Here in New York City, hundreds of demonstrators chanted slogans, burned the United States flag, threw paint at police, and disrupted traffic. Officials say some 250 students skipped school to take part in these protests. Anti-war protests are not confined to the United States. In Berlin, some 500 anti-war demonstrators gathered in front of the U.S. Army headquarters, showing their displeasure at the possibility of war. Most of the protesters were German students. One banner said, war cannot be the answer. Similar demonstrations taking place in other German cities. And in Jordan, anti-U.S. feelings are in the air. Thousands of Jordanians and Palestinians crowded the streets of Amman to demonstrate support for Iraq. The crowd chanted slogans urging Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein to use deadly chemical weapons against the U.S.-led multinational force in the Gulf. Some protesters burned American and Israeli flags. Numerous anti-U.S. demonstrations have been held in Jordan since the crisis began. Today's was one of the largest. 
Uh, I was afraid to go to the doctor. I didn't want to hear that I might have an ulcer, but I just couldn't ignore my stomach. Uh, you can imagine how relieved I was when my doctor said, my lanta. He told me it wasn't an ulcer. It was indigestion. And indigestion like mine needed a strong medicine. Mylanta is strong medicine. Strongly recommended. In fact, Mylanta is the antacid doctors recommend most. My doctor said Mylanta. Some people are still wondering if PIP printing does multicolor printing. The answer is yes, we do a little. Enough to fill this little football field every day. Color printing. One more reason PIP printing's the biggest business printer in the world. What happens when we put Clorox bleach in soft scrub cleanser? Ooh, the label turns green. And stains come clean. Get soft scrub with the stain fighting power of bleach. <coughs> Ricola. The all-natural herb cough drop imported from Switzerland. Ricola has been soothing throats and relieving coughs naturally for over 60 years. As the world counts down to the United Nations deadline, the question of the moment is whether a last-ditch peace is possible. CNN senior correspondent Mark Walton probes for an answer by getting the views of veteran negotiators and career diplomats. Move up, Bravo, go, pick man. it up, pick it up! Deja vu, on the brink of war, 1962, Soviet missiles are moved into Cuba, 1990, Iraq moves into Kuwait, American forces are mobilized. I have directed the armed forces to prepare for any eventuality. No one should underestimate our determination to confront aggression. In both cases, a collision force with no apparent way out. It is, it, you know, Kuwait is Iraq's southern enough. part. Iraq must withdraw from Kuwait completely, immediately, and without condition. In 1962, a last-minute breakthrough, a secret trade-off. What we did was uh, uh, make clear that we were going to insist on their removal of their missiles uh, from Cuba, uh, but accompanied it by an unannounced agreement uh, that we would uh, be removing our missiles from Turkey. This time, I can't tell you that there's any uh, hidden agenda out there, secret negotiations. There is not. There can be nothing done in secret, but I think all the elements of a deal are already there. They're already very public. What are the possibilities, the ingredients of a peaceful solution that would satisfy American interests and would last? Among veteran negotiators, there's a consensus that Saddam must be persuaded without being rewarded, chastened without being destroyed. And to do that, I maintain you have to have a ladder down which you can climb. And you have to have a scenario which, which gives him, as I'm mixing metaphors here, a sort of... A, perspective into which he can retreat. If you have a third party in between you, conveying first the message and then listening to the response and then saying, does that mean that if you did such and such, you would expect the Americans to do so and so, you, you have a little bit of a capacity to try things out without making commitments. We have said that if he withdraws from Kuwait, then we see no reason why Kuwait and Iraq and uh, and Saudi Arabia can sit down, for example, together and talk about some of the other issues he has in mind. We can indicate that there will be a way for them to work their way back into uh, relations with us, uh, and that the uh, sanctions will be progressively lifted as certain arms control measures are negotiated. That is possible. We oppose linkage. The coalition opposes linkage. I would think it's negotiable. It would seem to me quite clear that when he invaded Kuwait, 
He had not the slightest thought about what this would do to the Palestinian issue. The United States might say to the Iraqis that we reject your attempt to link the Gulf crisis to the Arab-Israeli conflict. But even before this crisis, we had intended to move on the Arab-Israeli issue. And when this crisis is over, we will do so. But there's no linkage. We've seen him use chemical weapons on his own people. I'm deeply concerned about Saddam's efforts to acquire nuclear weapons. They are still important, critically important issues, but they're not part of the current undertaking. We'll do those politically, economically. The Soviet nuclear threat was dealt with by political means, and that threat was a thousand times more serious than the Iraqi nuclear threat. What we really should want from Iraq is to be strong enough to defend itself against its own rapacious neighbors, namely Iran and Syria, but not so strong as to threaten everybody. Now, that's a fine line. What mistakes have been made? What might have been tried through diplomacy to keep us from arriving, as we have, at the brink of war? The strategy being used by the United States in support of its warning and threat has been the game of chicken. The insults, the threats to put him on trial as a war criminal. The president's been locking himself in. He's been giving himself no way out. What we've got to do is recognize the guy might be flexible. And therefore, you've got to figure out uh, what will move him in our direction. But is there time? The problem may be that we are now a few days away from the moment of truth. And whether an Arab leader, and particularly this Arab leader, can turn around this fast, even if he wanted to, that I'm not sure about. Nor is the rest of the world. I'm Mark Walton, CNN Special Reports. It begins at dawn. They've come for you. And they want what you have. It's your bed. Your sort of perfect sleeper. But it's the most comfortable spot in the house. The Serta surface and support only Serta builds in makes it that way. So if it gets a little late for breakfast, there's always brunch. Is it any wonder people are saying, I want my Serta? We now conclude this edition of CNN's special report on the Gulf crisis. In Washington, I'm David French. Good night, David. At CNN Center in Atlanta, I'm Lou Waters. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Coming up, Larry King Live, followed by Evening News here on CNN. In communities all across America, there grows a mighty forest in small towns and big cities where people are making beautiful music together, planting here, pruning there, all with the help of their free tree care guide from the National Arbor Day Foundation. This is Eddie Albert. Write the National Arbor Day Foundation for your free how to prune guide and help make your town a tree city USA. Where does the South Bay turn for world headlines and up to the minute local news? An update on what's going on in the South Bay. The Bay Cable News Report from KPIX and Heritage Cable Vision. Good morning, I'm Bob Holman. Once every hour, the latest breaking stories from the South Bay and the world. Dave McElhatton, Wendy Takuda, Kate Kelly, and more. KPIX and Heritage Cable Vision. The Bay Cable News Report, only on Cable 17A. Mommy, mm -hmm. where do wiener dudes come from? Oh, well, sweetheart, um, some people are just born with a wiener dude attitude, and you never really... We interrupt this sensitive moment for some real news. The 39 cent mustard dog. That's right, for a limited time, Wiener Schnitzel's original mustard dog is only 39 cents. What a bargain, what a steal, what a great thing to do with mustard. Get your 39 cent mustard dog today at Wiener Schnitzel. Mommy, is Billy a wiener dude? Well, wiener dude. <laughs>
<laughs> the book's grown and I've slipped. No, I'm sure it's just that the book's grown. In fact, we say if it isn't in here, maybe it doesn't exist. Television at War, tomorrow at 7.30 on Channel 7. Two of Yasser Arafat's top aides are shot in Tunis, and the spokesman of the PLO says the war has begun. We'll be reporting tonight from Jericho and Jerusalem, from Saudi Arabia and Washington, and we're coming to you live from Jordan. Standing by in Tel Aviv, the man at the head of the Israeli military, Defense Minister Moshe Ahrens. He'll be joining us in a moment. This is ABC News Nightline, reporting from Amman, Jordan, with the latest on the Gulf crisis, Ted Koppel. Almost exactly 24 hours from now, U.S. and other coalition forces will be empowered to launch military action against Iraq. Whether or not to exercise that option rests firmly in the hands of President Bush. But lest anyone forget just how volatile the situation is here in the Middle East, the sound of gunfire has already been heard this evening outside the Tunisian capital of Tunis, where an assassin has shot and killed Abu Iyad, second only to Yasser Arafat in the PLO. Dead also the PLO's chief of security and the bodyguard. It is already Tuesday morning here. Dawn is just breaking in the Middle East, and it seems almost inevitable that there will be Palestinian demonstrations later today on Israel's West Bank and equally inevitable that Israeli security forces will crack down. Yasser Arafat, who left Baghdad during the night en route to Paris, presumably for some last-ditch negotiations to avert war, stopped here in Amman, heard the news about his aides, and has returned to Baghdad. Joining us now live from Tel Aviv, the Israeli Minister of Defense, Moshe Arams. Minister Aaron, sometimes questions have to be asked even when you don't necessarily expect a straightforward answer. Were Israeli agents involved in the assassination tonight? Uh, I expected you to answer that question, uh, to ask that question, Ted, and uh, the answer is definitely no. We had nothing to do with it. I think it was probably the work of some dissident faction in the PLO. We here are busy preparing ourselves just in case Saddam Hussein makes good on his deadly threats against Israel. Nevertheless, do you not expect that uh, the Iraqis and perhaps uh, Yasser Arafat also will somehow try to gain some benefit from this event? I think that probably is expected uh, in the propaganda field. I hope that uh, no actual forceful action will be taken. When you say no actual forceful action, you, you must anticipate uh, the likelihood of demonstrations on the West Bank today. Uh, it's possible, although I think that the Palestinian population in, in the West Bank is fully cognizant of the different dissident and breakaway groups in the PLO and the internecine strife, and they may understand better than most people uh, just who the culprits are in this case. See if you can explain for us a little bit why the timing, whoever it was who was behind this, and uh, we may even know before the day is out because apparently the assassin has taken a couple of hostages uh, and is inside a building on the outskirts of, uh, of uh, Tunis and maybe he will be taken alive. But why the timing? What do you, what's your analysis? Well, first of all, I see that you know more than I do. I didn't realize that the assassin uh, was holed up somewhere in Tunis. And if that is the case, then I suppose it will become quite clear very shortly uh, just who the assassin was. Uh, I, I suppose he has the answer as to the timing. Uh, I really can't say that. Let's talk for a moment about the negotiations, the talks, the discussions, however you want to characterize them, that have been going on over the past couple of days between your government and Deputy Secretary of State Eagleburger. Uh, was he there for the purpose of coordination? And if so, has there been any coordination? Because there clearly has not been much on the military level over the past few weeks. Well, not really. You know that Israel and the United States have a long-standing uh, uh, friendship and program of uh, meetings, uh, strategic cooperation agreement. And I think that you should see Eagleburger's visit here really as part and parcel of those meetings that we hold quite, quite frequently and, of course, quite naturally at the present time. Well, it has been suggested to me that one of the great dangers is, since your government has said it would respond militarily if any attack is launched against Israel, there would clearly be some fears of mid-air collisions or Israeli planes taking out U.S. planes, U.S. planes taking out Israeli planes over the Gulf area, over the Iraq area. Has there at least now been a decision made to coordinate that? 
I think that, uh, first of all, I hope that that uh, eventuality will not arise. We here are uh, hoping that Saddam Hussein will not attack us. But of course, we are ready just in case he does and, and we will strike back. Under those circumstances, I'm counting on us finding uh, the ways of making sure that there are no untoward accidents. Well, that's not the kind of thing that you just uh, wing. You don't ad lib that sort of thing. What I'm asking you, Minister, is whether those arrangements have now been made. Well, I think you'll understand if I don't want to go into any further details. I understand that you don't want to go into details. I'm just asking you whether at least there is that level of coordination between U.S. and uh, Israeli forces, because while you talk about the long-standing good relationship between the two countries, uh, there have been efforts for precisely the reasons you're suggesting to keep Israel and the United States at arm's length. Well, all I can tell you is that if uh, a situation like that arises, and I hope it doesn't, but if it does arise, we will very shortly find the ways and means of avoiding any accidents. I am, uh, as you know, in Amman, Jordan, and the military here has been put on the highest level of alert. The number of Jordanian troops in the Jordan Valley facing the Israeli border uh, is the highest that it has been since the 1967 war. Does King Hussein, do the Jordanians have anything to worry about from Israel? Uh, he has nothing to worry about from Israel. I think he knows that. We are aware of the fact that his army is on alert. We are aware of the fact that they've taken up positions, or much of the army, has taken up positions in the Jordan Valley. Uh, if they don't take any action against Israel, then they have absolutely nothing to worry about. When you say they have nothing to worry about, are you also giving an assurance to uh, King Hussein and the Jordanians that Israeli warplanes would not overfly his country in the event that it was necessary for them to undertake any action against Iraq? Uh, I'm giving him absolute assurance that we shall take no offensive action against Jordan, either on the ground or in the air. That was uh, an elegant evasion, Minister, but what I asked you was simply whether you would overfly. That is the assurance that I'm ready to give, and I think King Hussein is fully aware of it. Is it your estimate at the moment that there is still a possibility of some peace initiative working, and if so, which one? You know, I, I don't think anybody here can uh, really understand uh, Saddam Hussein, what, is, what he is up to whether he fully understands the tremendous might that has been arrayed against him in the Persian Gulf. And if he does understand that, uh, why is he not ready to uh, agree to the conditions set forth uh, by President Bush? And since we don't understand that, it's really very hard to say whether there is so, still a chance that any time between now and tomorrow or the day after, uh, he will change his position. Uh, I would Let hope that he will, but so far he has given no signs of doing so. Let me turn the question around, and uh, you have, I'm sure to your own regret, have a great deal of experience uh, with pre-war atmospheres. Is it your sense that war is going to break out? My impression is that unless uh, Saddam Hussein does meet the conditions that have been set by President Bush, uh, that President Bush is very determined uh, to use the force that has been arrayed uh, facing Kuwait. Minister Ahrens, thank you very much. It was gracious of you to join us. I appreciate it. Thank you. When we come back, we'll be talking with some Palestinians on the occupied West Bank. We'll be talking with some Israelis in Jerusalem, with reporters covering the various elements of the Persian Gulf crisis from Washington to the UN to the Middle East. And we will visit a platoon of Marines on the front lines of what may be the eve of battle. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by DuPont. Mary Brody won't feel the tiny lump in her breast for another two years, but she'll discover it tomorrow after her first mammogram, thanks in part to a new X-ray film created by DuPont that makes it safer to start mammography early. And for Mary, early detection means a two-year head start on the rest of her life. At DuPont, we make the things that make a difference. Did you know? It's tough getting business people to agree on what's best. Yet business people do agree. Nobody beats AT&T when it comes to long distance service. In an independent poll where users rated their carriers, AT&T was unsurpassed in the best technology and best service categories and was voted number one in overall satisfaction. So now that we've agreed on AT&T, it's back to business as usual. Quality, another AT&T advantage. Welcome to El Torito's Sizzling Fajitas Fiesta.
our famous steak or chicken fajitas with your choice of a taco, an enchilada, taquitos, and more, all for just $7.95. Our sizzling fajitas combinations. When we're hot, we're hot. Get free nachos with any of El Torito's $7.95 fajita combos. The Accord four-door sedan. We took a good idea and built on it. Introducing the Accord Wagon from Honda. On the eve of the deadline, the threat of war is on all our minds. For the latest on the Gulf crisis, stay with ABC News and watch Peter Jennings on ABC's World News Tonight. Joining us now to help us understand the unfolding elements to this story, ABC's David Ensor. He's at the United Nations in New York. He just came back with Secretary, the General Secretary of the UN, Perez de Cuellar, from the failed mission to Baghdad. Joining us here in Amman, Jordan, is Geraldine Brooks of the Wall Street Journal. She has been in Baghdad some 10 times between last August and today. She has just returned from her latest visit to Baghdad. And standing by at the White House in Washington, ABC's White House correspondent, Britt Hume. David, I'd like to go to you first because one of the questions that is being asked right now about Saddam Hussein is what can be done to save face for him? What can be done to help him climb down the ladder from this confrontation? From what you heard from Perez de Cuella, is this a man who seems inclined to want to climb down the ladder, or for that matter, one who is concerned about saving face? The impression I got from Perez de Cuellar, Ted, was that, uh, that there's very little hope, quite frankly. He felt, after two and a half hours of talking to uh, Saddam Hussein, that here was a man who was uh, serene, despite the threat of, uh, of carnage and the, uh, the, the forces that are arrayed against him and a man that wasn't interested in talking. Uh, Perez de Cuellar said uh, he invited me, but he didn't seem interested in what I had to say, and he had nothing to offer me. Uh, if, if Saddam Hussein is looking to make a deal with somebody, he certainly wasn't interested in doing it with the UN Secretary General. How did he characterize not just his mood, but sort of his, uh, his psychological framework right now? Well, he, as, as I said, he was mystified by how serene the man seems. Uh, he said uh, he... Uh, he received me uh, like a man who's in a very good mood, a uh, very genial host. Uh, would you like some more tea? Would you like some more coffee? Chatting, small talk. Not very interested in discussing the issues at stake. He never mentioned the name of the State of Israel. He only briefly alluded to the need for a, uh, a Middle East peace conference to settle the Palestinian issue, which is one of the issues that his people are out saying uh, has got to be settled or his troops don't leave Kuwait. So uh, Perez de Cuellar found it mystifying and rather depressing, the whole thing. I incorrectly uh, identified Britt Hume as being located at the White House right now. He is, in point of fact, at the ABC News Bureau in Washington. Britt, ultimately, I suppose this comes down now to a face down between two men. And, and while I don't want to characterize the question the same way that I did uh, to David about Saddam Hussein, the mood of the president right now and the degree to which he needs, to one degree or another, also to save face. Well, Ted, uh, he's quite worried and anxious, more so than at any time that I have seen him, although I, today it must be mentioned he did uh, find a way to cut up a bit in public uh, during one of the uh, photo ops that uh, we saw today. Uh, it also ought to be said, Ted, that in terms of saving face, he really hasn't left uh, much room for that, not much room for diplomacy to do its work in the classic sense. He's uh, set forth terms which he insists must be met without compromise. And uh, I don't think that uh, he feels that he has uh, much room for flexibility, much room for uh, anybody to offer him any gestures to save face. He is basically called for a, a withdrawal, and anything short of that won't do. During the course of this day, Britt, uh, we've heard a number of possible peace proposals floated uh, from the Yemenis, from the French. Uh, indeed, it was even rumored that uh, 
Yasser Arafat, not rumored, Yasser Arafat was on his way to Paris. The rumor part of it was that he was there to discuss a uh, possible peace initiative with the French. Uh, none of those seem to be of any interest to the White House right now, or at least do not seem to be starters. Right? Well, I don't, I don't think that, there, that there's any feeling that there's much hope for them. The, the reason being that the administration has set forth such a firm stance. Uh, there's a rather unyielding uh, stance set forth, really, in the United Nations resolutions, which uh, the president insists are the touchstone of his policy. And therefore, any, uh, any um, uh, wiggle room that uh, might be the basis for the normal kind of diplomacy that could resolve a situation like this simply isn't available as far as the administration is concerned, or presumably, if the president uh, is right about it, as far as any of the coalition partners are concerned. Geraldine Brooks, you are literally just back from Baghdad, uh, and we have become accustomed over the past few weeks to hearing the mood in Baghdad as being described as remarkably unwarlike and unconcerned. Has that mood changed over the past few days? I think it is a mix, really. There's a, there is a, an air of quiet desperation starting to seep in uh, to the population there. You hear people talking quietly of making provision to send their children out of the city some people, the, the price of, uh, of a used car has shot up some 50% as people make contingency plans. They talk about going to the uh, holy Shiite cities of Kobler and Najaf because they believe that the United States won't bomb those two cities. And in terms of their feeling about the imminence of war, do you get any sense of that? It's, it's, a, it's a mix. There is a, there's still a, a strong streak of denial that there will be war among the Iraqi people. They're grasping at, at anything that comes their way. They grasp at the Paris de Cuella visit. They, they said Congress will never allow the President Bush to do this. Uh, now they're probably grasping at the, uh, at the French proposals and the Yemeni proposals. And then they say, if war comes, we Iraqis are tough. We know what war is. We survived it for eight years. They don't seem to realize that what's at stake here is so much bigger uh, than anything they've ever confronted before. Even as we have been speaking, reports have been running on the wires, uh, and apparently they have now identified the assassin of those PLO leaders in Tunis uh, as having been a former member of uh, Abu Nidal, or possibly a continuing member of Abu Nidal's faction. Uh, explain to me, not I, I, I don't want to get into the intricacies of what goes on inside uh, Fatah or inside the PLO, but explain to me what reason there might be and who would benefit most, in your view, from the timing of this incident. I think there's no doubt that Saddam Hussein will benefit from this in terms of the uh, already considerable fervor uh, that he's managed to create uh, T trying to drown out all mention of Kuwait in in a Israeli-Palestinian uh, framework that he's he's put this conflict into, I think he'll be the beneficiary. As to the timing, from Abu Nadal's point of view, I think the key question is where is Abu Nadal? We don't know that, and any state motivations in this, I think that that's the key. Just in terms of, of identifying him for the purpose of our audience, who is Abu Nidal? And maybe you can identify him by linking him to a couple of the, the incidents that, he, that are associated with him. Well, I think he's been one of the most uh, ruthless terrorists uh, of our time. The Roman Vienna airports massacres, I think, are, the, uh, are uh, up there uh, as the two most memorable uh, of, his, of his terrorist atrocities. Let me go back now to David Ensor at, at the UN. Anything planned now, David, uh, for tomorrow, which is quite literally the last day uh, before uh, the, uh, the time expires? Well, at the moment, Ted, uh, there are quite a lot of people in the building behind me, and uh, there may be an all-nighter uh, underway or, or about to start. They're still waiting for uh, uh, UN Secretary General Perez de Cuellar to come here to give his report to the uh, Security Council. And there's talk among the delegations of maybe a, passing another resolution or taking some other sort of action. It's all very much in the rumor stage right now, but uh, there could be quite a bit of activity here in the next 24 hours. Brit Hume, a closing note from you. Do you expect the president to be a very visible man tomorrow, or is he likely to retire? I don't expect him to be terribly visible tomorrow, Ted. And I must say, uh, following up on your question to David, that I think that when Secretary of State Baker returned here exhausted, 
from his uh, tour of the uh, coalition countries that the uh, United States uh, diplomacy uh, in this had just, just about been exhausted. And it's worth noting uh, that in these 11th hour meetings, they've all been within the alliance. There's been very little effort on the part of the U.S. to reach out to uh, Baghdad in any way, uh, preferring to feel that the move was up to Saddam Hussein, as indeed it is. Brett Hume, David Ensor, Geraldine Brooks, thank you all very much. I spent part of yesterday in the West Bank city of Jericho speaking with some Palestinians. We'll have that conversation when we return. On the road, the Infinity Q45 becomes a living, breathing thing. You feel it work the wind and seize the road. Feel the embrace of leather and luxury. The rarity of a 278 horsepower V8 engine that was born to run. And begin to understand why Road and Track has named it one of the 10 best cars in the world. 10 years ago today, they called us May, December. You with a flush of youth on your cheeks and me with a hint of snow in my hair. And they laughed at our recklessness when we used words like love and forever. And on our 10th anniversary, on a night very much like tonight, with the clouds playing tag with the moon, December wants to thank you for bringing me May. A changing world. It's times like these when you count on Channel 7 News. The people, the experience, the team that puts your world into perspective. Ana Chavez, Richard Brown, Don Sanchez, Cheryl Jennings. Channel 7 News, experience you can count on. The biggest event of 1991? The CNR January Clearance Sale. On now. Nobody beats Home Depot. Nobody. Home Depot will beat any price, any store, any identical item, any day. And low prices are just the beginning. We feature premium interior latex paints from America's Finest. For easy one-coat coverage and 10-year durability, choose America's Finest only at Home Depot. When you're with us at Home Depot, you feel right at home. H&R Block can get you every possible dollar that you have coming. America's tax team wants to save you money on your taxes. We are trained to find every credit and every deduction that the tax law allows. Income taxes are all we do. We're here whenever you need us. I will find you the maximum refund that you're entitled to. We're going to take the worry out of your tax return. The tax team stands behind its work. No wonder more people choose Block to get their tax returns done right. We're America's tax team. Put us to work for you. Pilots with alcohol problems. Pilots who admit to flying under the influence. Is your pilot flying high before your plane takes off? Prime time Thursday. The January 15th deadline. Tomorrow are the troops prepared for America's next move in the Gulf. Our guests will include Admiral William Crow on Good Morning America tomorrow. We are gathered in the garden of a private home in the ancient city of Jericho with four Palestinians who have that in common. Other than that, uh, however, we have chosen people of different generations and different backgrounds. Jamal, I'd like to begin with you. What plans have you and your family made for the 15th? Well, we haven't done very much. We can't, one can't do very much at all. But um, we've prepared ourselves slightly. We have some tins of uh, food. Um, we've also got um, some masking tape, wide masking tape to cover the windows, seal off the windows, prevent any air from entering. You're going to school that day? No. We have a holiday until the 15th, the 16th, we go back. But um, depending on what the situation is, I think the holiday might very well be extended. On the 15th, Mr. Dukat, what do you think is going to happen here in the event of war? Well, basically, I would say that the feeling uh, between the Palestinians and the Israelis will be uh, maximized in terms of uh, misunderstanding, lack of communication, and probably hatred and inability to uh, establish any future uh, coexistence or a modus vivendi. Do you expect any specific events to take place? 
Well, I think uh, assault against the Palestinians, uh, greater measures of brutality, and there is a lot of talk that there are troops being trained to help exp uh, expelling the Palestinians out of their country. Do you genuinely believe that the Israelis would use the cover of war? I mean, they would have greater concerns, obviously, if war breaks out. Do you yes. think that they would use a war against the Palestinians? And if so, how? Yes, it seems to me the war situation is going to provide the cover for the Israelis, whether it's the official Israeli government or whether it's extremist groups among Israeli settlers and in the army. There's a difference? Yes, there is a difference. I don't think it will be an adopted open public policy to do that. But I think that acts of violence and murder and uh, expulsion will take place because world attention will be focused elsewhere. Shamal, if war breaks out, one would think that the Israelis have so many other concerns, so much more important, so much more pressing, so much more dangerous, that if anything, the Palestinian issue would be put on the back burner. Well, I don't think so. I think Israel is worried that if it turns its attention too much to attacking Saddam or whatever, it wants, whatever else it wants to do, or protecting itself against him, um, that the Palestinians will start a full, full-scale revolution like in Romania and sort of try to take over everything in a matter of hours. So, um, you know, there's a very real problem is for the Israelis. Is, is that a legitimate fear? Is there, is there any chance that that would happen? Well, it seems to me that it will be very difficult because what we expect is a, a clampdown on the uh, occupied territories. We expect curfews and we expect closed military areas. So even if there is a spirit, a willingness to do that, it won't be very possible. And people will be trying to protect themselves in many ways. And uh, it seems to me the Intifada will have to refocus its attention on issues like uh, medical relief, self-defense, supplies, uh, communications, uh, uh, warning systems, and so on. Is there, Hanan, uh, a sense of anger against the United States and, and sort of the mirror image of that, a sense of pride in what Saddam Hussein is doing? You can say that there's a sense of anger and frustration against the United States, with Why? the United States, because they see very clearly uh, a double standard policy, lack of even-handedness, and, and very blatantly a uh, position of uh, moral and political uh, hypocrisy. Uh, the hypocrisy as seen from the United States is focused on Saddam Hussein. There, there is a great feeling in the United States among many people, I won't say all, that Saddam Hussein is taking advantage of the Palestinian issue to deflect attention from his invasion of Kuwait. I think hypocrisy is not uh, what worries me. I think uh, um, what I feel very distressed about is that it can either be a state of war or a state of peace in this region. And uh, when the peace option was offered, and the Palestinians said they wanted to make peace with their enemies and called for an international conference, the United States policy, as far as I read it, was not uh, uh, to really make this a reality. Let me ask all four of you now, and then I'm afraid uh, the time goes so quickly, we've, we've already used up most of our time. But let me ask each of you, Hanan, beginning with you. I'm not asking you what your hopes are. Mm -hmm. I know what those hopes are. I'm asking you what your belief is, what your expectation is with regard to war in the Gulf. Do you think it will happen? I still think that there is room for diplomacy. I still think there is room for negotiations and for a reasonable and responsible settlement because otherwise then the whole voice of reason, the whole language, the whole discourse of peace will be undermined and destroyed in the region and the language and discourse of violence will be consecrated and we will not be able to effect a peaceful solution to the Palestinian-Israeli question for a very, very long time. Roger? My instinct that the war will not take place and my instinct is that um, it has, been, it has become very clear what the perpetuation of this crisis, the Palestinian-Israeli one, can mean to the world because it has brought it to the brink of war. And I think this is to our advantage. This is what we've been saying all the time. Resolve the situation or there may be a global war. And we're close to a global war. So maybe this message will finally be heard by the world. Mr. Dekar. Well, personally, I, I hope that uh, peace will prevail and war will take place. But nevertheless, I, I think that there are very high chances for war to start. Because? Because of the American intransigence. American intransigence? Yeah. German? People are preparing, uh, my friends. But uh, 
they don't, nobody's frightened, so they don't take it um, that seriously. I mean, if there's a war, then there's a war, and everything will change, but nobody is really frightened.